Hello everyone, this is uh, Dragos and today me and Samir are going to talk about uh, maliciously secure matrix multiplication with applications to private deep learning. And uh, this was joint work with uh, Hao, Miran, Ilya, Yongsu and uh, Samir. And this work started, I think, one year ago while me and Samir were, uh, were interning at Microsoft uh, Research in Redmond. Uh, good times. So what, what is multi-party computation? And we have a bunch of parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, who want to compute a function over their inputs while keeping them private. This is basically what multi-party computation allows you to achieve. And uh, in the private of, of, in the realm of private machine learning, you, we can replace those inputs of Alice and Bob with uh, models and Charlie's input with a picture. And in this case, Charlie would like to get the prediction of Alice and Bob's model uh, without revealing the, 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 the beautiful cat. Um, so how are they going to do that? They're going to do that, obviously, using multi-party computation. So what does that mean to compute f of a, b, and c? Well, it boils down to a bunch of private matrix multiplication and private comparisons. We're going to focus, and we are focusing in this paper on pr obtaining private matrix multiplications more efficiently. So in this sense, like think that Alice uh, and Bob hold the matrix A, which is secret and um, Charlie also holds the matrix C, which is secret, and they want to get the product of these. So our result is we can obtain more efficient convolution layers for this honest majority. Uh, to give you like a rough idea of what's happening there, uh, we're in, in this in this talk we're, we're going to talk always about additive secret sharing. What does that mean? Well, this model. Uh, which you've seen on the previous page, is additively secret share between Alice and Bob, such that each individual share reveals nothing about the final uh, model. But if they combine the two uh, shares, they can reconstruct the output. The same goes with the grumpy cat. You, they don't know they have a sharing of a grumpy cat. They can only see that if they put their shares together and uh, th uh, then they can reconstruct the grumpy cat. So we focus on the, on the land of, in the land of dishonest majority. So when that model is, uh, is replaced with ResNet 50, which is a, a big convolutional network. And we wanna get uh, the prediction on the ResNet network uh, with a secret image. So we have a secret model, which is the ResNet model, and we have the secret image. Uh, when evaluating that model using the secret image, we can reduce the cost from five terabytes to 41 gigabytes. So classically with known techniques, this would take the evaluation of that model on the secret image it would take around five terabytes of communication between the parties. But now it can, we show that it can take uh, around 41 gigabytes. So this is, this is quite cool, uh, we believe. So there, there was some prior work done in this, uh, in this land in achieving matrix multiplication um, using, using secret matrices. So I think the first one that uh, we, we recall is uh, secure ML. So basically we've got two parties uh, and they're both acting, uh, acting accordingly to the protocol. Um, and they want to multiply two matrices and they use this to uh, do uh, a bunch of training or also predictions on, on secret models. Uh, so the, their idea was to, well, if you want to evaluate a model in machine learning, you go to the basic block, which is um, multiplying matrices. So how do you multiply matrices? Well, if you, if you manage to create 
uh, random matrix triple, a correlated random matrix triple, um, you can evaluate, you can multiply two matrices very efficiently. So what I mean by random matrix triple is that party A, uh, so these parties, these two parties have secret shares of A, B, and C, such that if they all sum their shares, they can reconstruct the secret. So in this case, C equals A times B, but where A and B are random, uh, chosen randomly uniform from a field or ring. So you can obtain matrices, matrix multiplication quite fast using, uh, using random matrix triples. Now, there's also the case where we've got more than two parties, right? We, we can have three parties. And in the case of honest majority, matrix multiplication can be done quite fast. Why? Well, because you can do dot products very efficiently in the honest majority. Uh, so suppose you have like a very big vector and you have another very big vector and you do the dot product, that pro dot product uh, can be done with constant communication overhead independently of those, of the length of those big vectors. So that's that's the main idea uh, people use to obtain matrix multiplication with honest majority. Now there's also honest majority, but with active security. So supporting at most one corrupt party, which can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol. Uh, and that can also be done uh, using dot products because products are efficient to do uh, with honest majority. There's some uh, uh, lots of recent work actually focused on obtaining these dot products as, as efficient as um, as we can. So what about this honest majority, right? There, we, we realize that there's not much research about how to multiply matrix triples with, uh, with a dishonest majority, meaning that uh, lots of parties can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol uh, and we still want to pro protect um, honest parties share. So what we do is basically, in a nutshell, we use the idea from secure ML, but we use it for convolution triples. So instead of generating matrix triples, we generate convolution triples. We add zero knowledge proofs on top of that, uh, which, is, um, which are the, the newer uh, variant for uh, homomorphic encryption zero knowledge proofs by Baum et al. And then we incorporate new uh, homomorphic encryption based techniques for matrix multiplication um, with, from two years ago at CCS. So what does, what does MPC, uh, so in, in, in our, in our uh, talk, in our paper, we, we work in the pre-processing model. So what does that mean? So if you've got a bunch of parties, the same parties as you saw at the last slides, um, and they want to compute on function over the inputs, they kind of they can split this uh, this process into two phases, right? So there's the first there's the phase of uh, well this is not this is before the two phases. You first unroll the the function f to a series of additions and multiplications. So for when, when you're going through f and you encounter a multiplication, you need to generate some sort of correlated randomness, for example, beaver triples. So what this beaver triple mean is, and what, what an additive be, shared beaver triple is, is that each party has uh, some random number, uh, or random numbers actually, uh, a1, b1, c1, and so on. And if they all sum their shares, so if you sum the shares or reconstruct A, uh, if you sum the shares of B, then you multiply these two, you're gonna get the sum of the sharing of C. So this is, this is quite, quite a crucial point when, when you're trying to do MPC in the pre-processing model, you need to, you have to use these beaver triples. Uh, so how, well, whenever you wanna multiply, for every nonlinear operation you're doing, uh, you fetch a new fetch a beaver triple and use it. We're not going to talk about how how you're going to use it, but uh, the high level idea is use a beaver you use a cor correlated random beaver triple from the pre-processing phase. In the online phase, uh, we call it online because parties get together and um, um, 
share their inputs. So it's kind of the input independent phase and the input independent phase, the pre-processing phase. Okay, so now we have this. What else do we need to understand the contributions? Well, homomorphic encryption, what does that mean? Well, we've got the party, uh, Charlie, who has some data and Charlie can send this data to the cloud uh, by first encrypting it um, and then sending over the ciphertext. So the cloud only sees garbage, but it's, it's encrypted. Uh, this garbage means it's encrypted data. Uh, so now the cloud can perform some computations, transform this um, ciphertext into another ciphertext such that in the end, it can decrypt to the function, to some function f, which was applied over the plain text. So basically the process goes like this. Uh, me as the client, I encrypt stuff, send it to the cloud. The cloud does some computation associated to some function f. When I receive the, plain the cipher text back, I can decrypt and I can uh, actually see that my plain text was uh, the function f, which was applied over the original data. So that's that's basically homomorphic encryption. You can do um, plain text operations by just manipulating the ciphertext. And now I'm gonna pass the baton to Samir. Samir, can you catch this? Thank you, Dragos, for the pen. So let me start by uh, giving the main result of this work. So prior work, um, in, in particular in the triple generation phase um, has a large amount of communication overhead. In particular, uh, if you want to do a matrix triple generation of size n by n, you require order n cube uh, communication. In this work, we demonstrate how to do this uh, communication, um, how to uh, demonstrate this uh, triple generation, uh, beaver triple generation uh, for matrices in order n square communication. So, Let's take a look at how we do this. So the triple generation protocol, I'm going to present it, um, how speeds does it, which is uh, the state of the art uh, protocol we built on, and then uh, how we change it to, to actually do this. So conceptually, the idea is very, very simple. Uh, each party locally just generates their shares, uh, A1, A2 up to AN and B1, B2, BN. And these, um, because of the linearity of the homomorphic encryption scheme, um, these can simply be added to, uh, to get shares of encryptions of A and B. And so A and B are like the underlying secret values. Now, given this, we need to, to generate a triple, we need to actually compute encryption of the product A times B. And this is where the homomorphic encryption part of this uh, encryption scheme comes into play. So each of these parties simply broadcasts their values since they are now encrypted, no one can decrypt it. Um, and so uh, in particular, a quick detail about this is like the encryption scheme is such that the public key is shared by all the, uh, is known to all the parties but the, the secret key is distributed among all the parties. And so all the parties now uh, distribute, um, uh, broadcast their, um, their encryptions, and then simply compute this, which is um, C, which is given by uh, encryption of A times encryption of B. So because of the homomorphic encryption property, this is uh, C is simply the encryption of A times B. Finally, the last bit of this uh, picture would be a distributed decryption protocol, which takes the ciphertext C which is the encryption of A times B, and then it splits it into additive shares, C1, C2, Cn, uh, such that sum of all of this is actually the decryption of the ciphertext. And so this is, uh, this is all prior work. The way we change this is, um, is conceptually very, very straightforward. Instead of having A1, A2, An all be just shares of a single number, uh, we actually have them all be matrices, where the sum of all of these matrices is the matrix A. And what, what we change is then we change this, um, this, uh, this product into uh, uh, a matrix product. So uh, under homomorphic encryption, you have a ciphertext which encodes a matrix, and then we actually want to uh, perform a matrix product of this. So uh, the first thing is when we are working in a dishonest majority protocol, um, we really have to ensure a lot of um, parties could really, really act maliciously. And so we need to ensure that the inputs are correct as well as the, the noise in the plain text uh, or the noise used to generate the ciphertext is uh, bounded and so on. And uh, because some of these could leak uh, secret keys in the distributed decryption protocol. 
And so uh, to do this, um, zero knowledge proofs are used and, and they ensure like a lot of these properties which we read. Uh, just to also quick uh, uh, quickly talk about this, um, since this is in the dishonest majority protocol, we also have each of these shares is an authenticated share. And so we have um, the max on each of these. And that's a detail which I'm going to skip because uh, it's fairly straightforward. You just um, do another ciphertext product with the um, encryption of the MAC key uh, with this, which is done publicly, and then uh, do a distributed decryption protocol. So the biggest uh, changes uh, to some extent are, are the following. So first is uh, doing the matrix multiplication over ciphertext over arbitrary size um, matrices. So this has some uh, technical challenges as well as like a number of systems uh, improvements, some of which I'll talk about later. Uh, the, the second important contribution here is the elimination of sacrifice by using a larger depth uh, homomorphic encryption scheme. So in particular, uh, we use a depth to homomorphic encryption scheme. So um, we can simply do a number of public uh, operations one after the other without have, having to do a distributed decryption or a resharing protocol in between. So I'm going to move into the zero knowledge proof part of this. So, so the zero knowledge proof, this is the starting point that each of these parties simply encrypt their local value and then uh, broadcast it. Um, the zero knowledge proof follows a very standard paradigm of a Sigma protocol where a Sigma protocol has like three phases, like a commitment, challenge, and a response. And um, this is simply the commitment phase where each party simply broadcasts their, uh, their own input. The second phase is a challenge where we build on a, a state of the art protocol. So um, this is the protocol from Top Gear where all these parties simultaneously act as a prover as well as a verifier. To, to simultaneously uh, validate their own encryption as well as uh, also ensure the other encryptions are well formed. And, and that's why um, they, they generate the, the challenge randomness um, jointly, like using everyone generating it locally and then um, using that. So here it's modeled by using a FRAND functionality. And finally, the response and verification is, is where like the parties really just uh, broadcast uh, openings of certain variables, which are generally statistically hiding the, the secret values. And then uh, the verification checks for certain bounds and so on. And, um, and that's the zero knowledge proof. Um, the key differences here are also the fact that we, we actually, for the first time, use BFV as the homomorphic encryption scheme and, and show that it has certain advantages, in particular when we use it over certain parameter regimes. Uh, we can reduce the communication overhead of the zero-knowledge proof um, by a small factor because it, it simply changes uh, from a statistically hiding scheme to, to actually information theoretically hiding um, certain parameters. So for the details, I'll again defer to the paper. With that, I'm going to spend some time on actually talking about the, um, the evaluation or the experimental results of this work. So, so I think this is um, uh, just a big chunk of the results of, on both the LAN and the WAN setting. So just to uh, briefly explain what this is. So on the left, we have the matrix sizes, which is uh, going from 128 by 128 uh, size matrix ripples to uh, about 1,000 by 1,000 size matrix. On the right, we have four columns. Um, so we have total time one and total time 16, and then speed 16, speeds one. And so speed 16, speeds one refer to the prior state of the art um, a protocol, which is uh, the speeds protocol, but also with all the advances uh, that have happened over the years. And total time refers to uh, the time of uh, our protocol. Uh, the 16 and one refer to implementations over 16 cores versus one core. And then the top table is uh, in the LAN setting and then the bottom table is in the WAN setting. So, and these are fairly standard uh, uh, network settings which uh, we have given the details in the paper. So I'm, instead of uh, presenting all these results, I'm going to focus on four uh, specific numbers and then kind of highlight uh, some of the key results here. So, so the first one is a fairly straightforward result, like what, what is the performance compared to prior art? And so here, uh, we can see that in the LAN setting, we are about 3.6 times faster. In the WAN setting, where the communication improvements, which is really what this work is about, uh, really start uh, playing a bigger role. Uh, that's where we are about 36 times um, uh, faster than prior work. The, the other cool uh, bit about this um, is that the fact that these are asymptotic results, so as we go to larger matrix sizes, so these are common, for instance, in ResNet, like 1,000 by 1,000 is a, a reasonable size matrix. As we go to larger size, um, the, the overhead or the improvement actually gets better because it's just um, asymptotic improvement. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, uh, the first result. 
The, the second one is also a very interesting result. So when we compare across these two tables, so what we're comparing is like uh, performance in the LAN setting versus in the WAN setting. Again, the fact that um, the WAN setting has much uh, uh, worse uh, network conditions, um, we have about an 11 times slowdown uh, in, uh, in prior art. Um, however, in, in our uh, protocol, we just notice a 13% slowdown. And this is a really interesting result because what it highlights is the fact that a bulk of the cost of our protocol comes from the computation cost as opposed to the communication because the only thing that changes between a LAN and a WAN deployment is the, compu uh, the communication because the computation is really the same in both of them. And so on the left, our protocol is really compute bound and on the right is uh, communication bound. And this is a really um, interesting, it has uh, important implications because one, um, computation is, uh, it can be paralyzed, we can have better hardware and it can be improved, there is hope there. But communication is, uh, is really dependent on the uh, network infrastructure we have and so if we have to send data across like from the east or west coast of the US, we have to incur a certain like 70 or 100 millisecond round trip time which, uh, which is something that cannot be improved further. Um, at least it's much harder to do it than, uh, than compute improvement. And so um, this is a really cool result that uh, the protocol is really compute bound and um, I think it just shows like how, um, how big of an improvement uh, this, uh, this protocol does. Uh, with that, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the details of the ciphertext, ciphertext matrix multiplication here. Uh, so we use the state of the art protocol from uh, 2018 uh, CCS. Um, and what it does is essentially transform a matrix product into something which is homomorphic encryption friendly. So it, uh, in terms of dot products or additions and, and the dot products uh, also involve certain rotations in them. So each one is a transformation. And um, this makes it, uh, this protocol really optimally uses the number of uh, slots in the homomorphic encryption um, uh, scheme. And in that sense, it's uh, fairly optimal. And so this uh, gave us great performances. However, we also have a number of uh, systems improvements um, and which, is, uh, which are mentioned in detail in the paper, but I just want to mention that uh, lazy key switching, um, which is sort of um, switching the order of uh, when we do the key switching, like to actually improve the performance. Um, hoisting as well as, um, hoisting is where we have to generate a number of uh, ciphertexts and we, uh, we optimize there and blocking, which is if you want to generate matrix triple of size thousand by thousand, but we do not want to blow up the homomorphic encryption parameters too much because it slows down performance. How do we do it in smaller chunks to actually sustain arbitrary size uh, matrices? So those are just some of the techniques um, and uh, these are presented in detail um, uh, in the paper. So with that, I'm quickly going to mention some f uh, future work um, on the next slide. Um, so I think this is uh, great because there are some really interesting questions which this work um, unfolds. So the first one is uh, extension to rings. So this work has demonstrated um, this triple generation, but over fields, but uh, with um, rings are much more um, amenable to efficient implementation. And so with work such as Speeds 2K, uh, which do this in the dishonest majority, it would be interesting to see how we can actually combine this triple generation idea with, uh, with those works. The second really uh, interesting um, idea is um, there is an emerging line of work which is on silent pre-processing or silent um, uh, just generation of uh, this pre-processing material and can we apply this matrix triples idea to, to the same and so in particular can we generate uh, matrix triples silently and so I have a quick reference here for one of the paper which might be interesting and we are happy to talk about this um, any of the authors like um, offline or in the question answer session. So. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Um, our paper is up on ePrint and so feel free to reach out to any of the authors, the email IDs I mentioned there and thank you.